Well, good evening. Let's go and get our service started. Good to see everyone out tonight. Um, don't forget all that's going on this week. We got the Run for God tomorrow night. And then uh, on uh, Tuesday, we have a senior adult Bible study. And it'll be at 11 o'clock. And then we have lunch uh, after that. And so that's always a really good time in God's Word. And then, and, then, and then one of the ladies will make something wonderful for us to eat afterwards. And then we have uh, on Wednesday, EBC Kids and the Youth Group will have a, a prayer uh, time and regular Bible study. We're going to begin a new study in the book of Judges this week. And I think, Philip, how did the introduction go? Did you get done within an hour or two? Uh, uh, oh, huh? Ehud. Okay. <laughs> and Okay. So we'll be going over all that in a lot of detail in the next few months in, in the book of Judges. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> he had supersized before that, huh? <laughs> and then uh, if you'd like to go, we'll be at the Justice Center uh, this week at uh, 6 o'clock. Uh, I think Ed's going to come and he'll be playing for us, but that's always a good service. And so, uh, again, kind of a revival taking place back there again. So last, last month was a really, really good service. And so uh, just be praying for that. Uh, too. And also we need nursery workers. Uh, if you can help in the nursery, uh, see Amber cook on that. That's just a tough job and keeping enough workers for that. And so um, if you can do that, uh, I know Amber would appreciate that a whole lot. Okay. Any other announcements we need to make? Okay. Not more. Need some more. You guys doing good tonight? You have, did everybody take a nap and get all rested up? Yeah. I almost took one, but they make me so cranky. Uh, I just let my wife do it. They don't seem to make her cranky. Err. <laughs> um, let's, let's do some out of the hymnal just because it's nice too. This one's number 406 in the hymnal, if you'd like to turn there, if you don't. Oh, let's, what do we got? Let's do that one first. Time. Come thou fount of every blessing, to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, calls for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious song. Sung by flaming tongues above, built a throne and fixed upon it, full of my redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I run, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be, let thy goodness like a Do the solid rock. The other one. Cool. That's one of those jazz chords, wasn't it? They're not allowed in here, are they? 
My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Oh, 
So guys, if you would, let's take our Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 13. And uh, uh, we're going to continue our teaching on um, uh, how we're to be responding to our government. And we mentioned last time, uh, 2 Timothy 2, uh, verses 1 through 2, where Paul told Timothy, uh, First of all then, I urge that uh, entreaties and prayers and petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Now that uh, is very easy to understand, but not always easy to obey. Uh, sometimes we can just get plain frustrated with government. We can get uh, frustrated with red tape. Uh, we don't want to pray for it. You know, we want to complain. And often we're not thankful uh, for the leaders that God has given us. But, you know, just, uh, but Paul has just, you know, told us uh, our duty uh, before we come to this text uh, of, of how we're to return good for evil in regards to our enemies. And now he tells us how we're to be relating to government. And we're uh, given in Romans 13 the origin of government and uh, the obligations of the believer to government and then the operation of government. And so let's just stand and let's just read verses 1 through 4 for tonight. And if you recall, and we're going to go over this verse 1 again, but uh, we studied that a couple weeks ago. It says, Let every soul be subject to the higher powers, uh, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive the, to themselves a damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Uh, do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. Uh, for he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he uh, beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, you must, it must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. Let us pray. Lord, our Heavenly Father, as always, we just thank you again for just uh, this time that you've given us to come out and just to worship and to praise your holy and precious name. And that, Lord, I just pray as we look at this topic, as our, how we're to relate to government, that, that Lord, that, uh, that you just speak to each of our hearts, uh, that, Lord, that you just give us peace, that, Lord, that we realize that you're still in control. Uh, whatever happens in November, uh, Lord, uh, uh, just not going to take you by surprise. Uh, but, Lord, uh, within this society that we live, I just pray that, that Lord, that we be the church that you call us to be. Uh, that, Lord, that we relate to government in, in a way that, uh, uh, that, is, uh, that uh, would bring you honor and glory. And so, Lord, to just use us and help us to stand strong and, and, and just use us to proclaim the gospel in a way that, uh, uh, that Lord, that you could bring revival, that you could change uh, uh, this nation from uh, the inside out, which is what uh, you always want to do. And so, Lord, uh, just take this message tonight and just speak to our hearts, and we'll give you the glory for all things. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now, if you recall last time, uh, we ended with six principles of how we should relate to government. And I want to re kind of relook at a few of those uh, before we get into these verses. And we said, first, uh, the Christian is to obey every ordinance of government insofar as it does not require him to ab abandon his conscience, his worship of God, or his obedience to Scripture. Now, you would think, you know, believers in the decaying Roman culture could d disobey unjust laws. You know, we belong to a new kingdom now, so why not refuse to obey or, or participate in our society? But the Bible says that the opposite of that is true. You know, later we're told to pay taxes. We're going to, to, to be told that we're to give honor to uh, where honor is due and, and to follow the customs of the land as, as long as they do not demand the violation of God's commands. You know, of course, Daniel in the Old Testament, he's the classic example of that truth. He was taken to a foreign land and he required to eat the king's meat. He was required to drink the king's wine. And the king's meat had, had in, in it unclean animals were fit, forbidden by God to the Jews. The king's wine would have been offered up to uh, the, 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 those gods before it would be uh, given to the king and, and, and to Daniel. So uh, he asked permission to eat vegetables and drink water. You know, Daniel made an issue of this because it went against God's law for him. But you remember at the same time, Daniel's name was changed to Belshazzar, which meant Bel's prince. 
And Daniel's name meant God is my judge or ruler. So we want to do a little bit of brainwashing here so they wouldn't remind you no know, Daniel every time his name mentioned that God was the ruler. But, uh, but Daniel did not refuse the name for God's law had not been violated. And so as long as, as law does not violate God's law, then we're to be obedient. You know, as a church, we are to obey the ordinance of the state. No matter, you know, sometimes we think they may be ridiculous or it may even be costly for us. You know, I know for some time we wanted to fill in the ditch out front of, a, of the church. And, you know, that seems pretty logical to us and the deacons. And, and if you've ever thought about that, but it doesn't seem logical to the state. And so we're not to make a big deal of that. We were not asked to violate God's commands in that. And so we just kind of leave us in an eyesore, I think. But, uh, but we, we do that because, because we want to obey the authorities that God has placed over us. And then the second principle we talked about, a moral government. Now get this, it's not necessary for the church to fulfill its mission. You know, if that was true, the, the early church would have, have been told to, you know, make some sort of moral majority. You know, a Christian voting block to bring moral restraints to bear upon that society. You know, we must have moral public leaders. We have to have rulers and magistrates in order for the church to be successful. But it was just the opposite of that. Ern Lutzer says this. He says, um, our nation needs an, an antidote uh, that is far more radical than political, uh, that politics could ever be. Our so-called culture war is really a spiritual war. Our problems are not fundamentally abortion, trash television, or homosexual values. The root of our cultural decay is first and foremost spiritual. We must attack the, uh, uh, the root of this corrupt tree. Our greatest challenge is theological, not political or cultural. And that leads to the third statement that we made, that the mission of the church is not moral reformation, it is spiritual transformation. And that almost maybe sounds strange to you tonight, especially if you've forgotten the mission of the church. It is not uh, the business of the church to keep society from plunging into wickedness. Our mission is not to make bad people good. Good people are already condemned by God, John 3, 18. You know, a policeman can go to hell just as much as a prostitute. A just judge can be condemned just as much as a, a criminal who sends to jail. We have not been charged by God to halt or diminish the evil practices within our society. Now that doesn't mean that we don't care about that, but it means we pursue change in our society one disciple at a time. We do it through the gospel by witnessing and proclaiming to them the good news of Jesus Christ of John 3.16 so that they can give their lives to Christ, so that they can be changed. So, said, but Brian, that, that's too old-fashioned. Brian, that's just too slow. Listen, our mission is to act like the salt and light so our community can see our good works so they can glorify our God in heaven. That's what we're speaking about this morning. Our mission is spiritual transformation. We are to strike at the root of the problem, not its symptoms. Remember Jonah. Now get this as a good illustration. He was not told to go to Nineveh and influence the king away from idolatry. He was not told to lobby to have child sacrifice outlawed. He was not told to go and reform the Ninevites. Jonah went to Nineveh as God's messenger with the same message that we have for our world today. He said, repent. God is not very in a very good mood over your sin. It's appointed for man to once to die after this to face the judgment. And we all know the story of the Ninevites, what they did. They repented. They fell on their faces before the message of God's justice and God's patience and giving them time to turn from their sin. And now, left, now because of that, child sacrifice stopped. Because of that, idolatry ceased. Listen, that is how we're to change our world. We're to transform it through the power of the gospel. And then think about Jesus' ministry. And he was much more concerned over the corruption of the so-called people of God than with the government or the civil, uh, civil systems of his day. One writer writes this, Jesus never made calls for political or social reform, even by peaceful means. He never attempted to capture the culture for biblical morality or to gain greater freedom for his followers. He did not come to proclaim or establish a new social or moral order, but a new spiritual order, his church. He did not seek to make the old creation uh, moral, uh, but to make his new creation holy. 
Uh, there was no effort on his part to eliminate social or political injustice. Although his followers would live such lives of purity and integrity and compassion, that social structure to be affected for 2,000 years. Amen. Folks, the most powerful tool on earth is not moral government, but a godly believer. It's the church being the church, what we should be. We pray, you know, for moral society, but we cannot, cannot make a difference in changing our society, in, 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 in honoring and glorifying God, uh, God without ourselves being godly and holy. Folks, the true battle is spiritual. The Bible says the weapons we fight, uh, fight with are not the weapons of this world. Uh, on the contrary, they are, have divine power to demolish strongholds. And so to attempt to vote or influence or, or make a petition or march to see moral advancement is to miss the whole mark of the church. Again, Erwin Lutzer says, We can argue with our culture that Christian morality is better. Uh, we can move to clean up our culture by legislation and boycotts and anything else that gets their attention. But our efforts will be like trying to mop up the floor with the faucet running. Why? Because we are trying to convince citizens of earth to live as though they are citizens of heaven and they are not buying it. You know, we're not living in the first time in, you know, in history when the church has, has had the responsibility of representing Christ when a society as a whole has abandoned God. And actually throughout history, the, the, the most effective ministries has occurred when the church realized it was not an agent, agent of moral confrontation. We're an agent of spiritual reformation. Francis Schaeffer defined it as becoming co-belligerents. He said, that's never, never resulted in spiritual reformation. You know, joining other Christians to take back lost ground in, in, in society or political arena has caused the testimony of Christ to suffer. It causes the mission of the church to be compromised, and the Word of God is often diluted. And, you know, there's well-meaning people who are preaching that, you know, we, we must reclaim America for Christ, and, you know, that sounds like the right thing to do, but it raises several issues first issue, it applies that Jesus had America at one point and lost it. A second, it applies that America was once a thoroughly Christian nation uh, when it was not, no nation has ever been. And in third, it implies that Jesus wants America back, so, so we must get the leaders and citizens of America to behave whether they believe in Jesus Christ or not. Folks, that's not the right message. Jesus is not teaching this word that, that the, his disciples are to claim or reclaim nations, but to go into all nations and preach the gospel to kingdoms that were passing away, who kingdoms or boundaries and times of existence were already established, already determined by the sovereign God of this universe. It might tickle our patriotic ears to hear, you know, a, 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 a call to reach America. But Scripture tells us our mission is not to save America. Our mission is to save Americans. That's what we're to be about as His church. That's the final point that, that kind of in review here, long review this morning, but, uh, or this afternoon. This evening, we're going to get there, man. Our mandates on earth is not to save our nation but to bring individuals from this and every nation to salvation by faith in Jesus Christ alone. Our task is the proclamation of the gospel. Listen to me, the gospel is what changes life. The gospel is what can change society. The gospel is the only thing that can change a nation. It's the power of God through salvation. And to swap our gospel for political activism, expecting government to become our ally, to adopt our morals, is to imply that the gospel is not powerful enough, it's not fast enough, it's not good enough to, uh, 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 to change people's hearts. It neglects our mission. It ultimately distorts our gospel. It's like a heart surgeon abandoning his profession to become a makeup artist you know, and spending his time to make people look better before they die. The mission uh, of the church is not to change our nation, even though that is often a benefit, even though that's a byproduct of believers who live faithful lives in ministry, in spreading the gospel, who live faithful lives in purity and different from the society that they live in. Amen. 
You know, that implies that legislation regarding, you know, the rights of homosexuals is not our mission. Uh, the, the, the eternal destiny of their soul is. You know, the success of, or, uh, or failure of legislation regarding abortion is not nearly significant as the souls of women who are buried with the guilt of having their unborn child killed. You know, whether or not prayer returns to the classroom uh, is not the issue of Christians, you know, to sign petitions, uh, being uh, heard uh, as the voice that explains who God is and how he must be approached through prayer. That's the issue we're to take to our society. You know, I was thinking if prayer was reestablished in public schools, you'd probably have a schedule. You know, praying on Monday to the Jewish God. On Tuesday, they can play to pray to Jesus Christ. On Wednesday, they can play to pray to Allah. Uh, Thursday to Krishna, and pray on Friday to the God of your choice. That's the society that we live in. You know what the courts decide on on euthanasia or evolution, and you know what could be taught in that public arena, what could be be done in that medical laboratory is not nearly as critical as the eternal destiny of human beings. That's why, again, I've been quoting from Pastor Lutzer a lot tonight. But um, he says we have a message that only we can deliver. It must be heard above all the din of political posturing and power. We have an agenda that is divinely inspired. It is more important than saving America. It's holding the cross of Jesus Christ high so that God might be pleased to save Americans. Amen. That's still the issue, the cross. Paul's passion was to save some with the gospel. And now look at this way. We are in a lifeboat on the sea of human history. We're surrounded by people who are dying. So we must not become distracted within our mission. We're not here to throw the drowning masses a book on how to tread water longer. We're not here trying to make them the water a little more comfortable for them. We're not selling them a better swimming suit. We're not encouraging them to, you know, try to backstroke. Our message is simply the kingdom of this world is passing away. You're in danger with the creator of the ocean for the wages of sin is death. Your only hope is Jesus Christ. Get in the lifeboat. That is our message. I like... um, uh, James Montgomery Boyce died a few years back, but uh, he wrote a book, Two Cities and Two Loves. And in that, he tells the story of E.V. Hill, uh, the pastor of a, a Mount Zion uh, Missionary Baptist Church in, in Los Angeles. And, and before he became a pastor there, he was a, 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 a ward leader in the Democratic Party. And his assignment was to get, the, get out the vote for the Democrat, Democratic candidate and and his chief strategy was uh, using block captains for each block of his war. And on election day, each of the captains would call the people on that block and make sure they went out and, 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 and voted for uh, that candidate. And, and he says that when he became a, a pastor, though, uh, he decided that, uh, 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 you know, if he was going to do that for the Democrats, he, he needed to do that for God. And so there's 1,900 blocks in his area. And so, so people of his church would actually move into those blocks for the very purpose of, 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 of reaching out to them in the name of Christ and inviting them to the church and, 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 uh, uh, and, and just for the sake of the gospel. And, and then Boyce tells a, a story that uh, happened on one occasion that one man had been uh, very put off by the block captain and, and she wasn't uh, rude or anything, but she was very persistent. She was very friendly and would always invite him to church and different things that was going on within that church. And so he decided to, to move away uh, to another part of Los Angeles. And so there, as he's loading up the U-Haul, she was there, and she waved goodbye to him and, 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 you know, and offered Christ love to him and, and, and said that uh, when he got to the new house, there was a, blo- uh, uh, a new uh, captain of that block who welcomed him into the neighborhood and invited him to church. And he said this, he says, My God, they're everywhere. <laughs> Isn't that good? Listen, I don't know what, that convicts me. What could we do in our town if we truly believed that we were called to deliver the gospel to every person in Dunlap? You know, E.V. Hill admits at one time he had greater passion to get out the vote for the Democrats than to get out the good news of salvation. And again, I'm not saying that we shouldn't vote. 
You know, Daniel Webster was right. He said, whatever makes a good Christian makes a good citizen. But if our passion, if our hope, if our focus is on getting the vote out, but not on external things, then our passion is temporal. Then our passion is passing away of governments. And, and, and we're looking, not, not preaching the eternal message and the mission uh, 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 of Jesus Christ. That is what we got to keep the focus upon. Now that was a long introduction. But let's get, let's get back. I do want to go over these verses today. And, and, and that's what, because we're talking about responsibility to government. What is the church to be doing in this society that we live in? First, we said submission to government is the command of God. Let's look at verse 1 again. It says, for every soul be subject to the higher powers. Remember we said that word subject or subjection is a military term. That we're just to fall under the rank of another. It means that we're to obey the commands of government. Just as a junior officer obeys his superior officer, we're to regard uh, uh, to civil authorities with respect, we're to have obedience, unless, again, their commands would violate uh, biblical commands or, uh, or telling us not that we could not proclaim the gospel of Christ. So God commands us to obey government. And the second half of that verse we talked about is that the government's institu instituted by God. For there, he says, is no power... Uh, but uh, of God, the powers that be ordained of God. Uh, the authorities of government has been delegated uh, uh, power from the Lord. God gave the power to exist and, and will hold them accountable. You know, the governors of the world will not get away with doing wrong. Remember when Jesus has stood before Pilate. You know, he's accused of treason there. And uh, for uh, uh, his accuser said, you know, he claimed to be king. And, and Pilate just kept after him and kept talking to him and asking questions. And Jesus wouldn't say anything. And finally, Pilate, in frustration, says, man, you do not speak to me. Do you not know that I have authority to, re to release you? And, have I, and I have authority to crucify you. And then Jesus answered this way. You would have no authority over me unless it had been given uh, you from above. I don't know. That is great news to the persecuted church. That is great news to us tonight, no matter what happens in society. Jesus said, Pilate, the power you have to rule and even to deliver me over to be crucified is power from God Himself. It is delegated authority. And Christ went on to say, For this reason, he who delivers me to you has the greater sin. You know, Pilate, you're going to stand accountable one day for these political decisions that you're making and delivering me up. But you know, this decision right now is it, it the will of heaven. You know, what is the authority of government? Is it the policeman's badge? Is it the robe of a judge? Is it the king's crown? No, no, no. Behind those symbols is the authority of God. And God takes serious the violations of, you know, cruel governments and corrupt judges and crooked officials. And Listen, there, one day they will stand accountable to God. Vengeance belongs to Him. We'll let Him take care of it. Yet that does not change our mission. If they deliver you up, you know, to the council, they deliver us up to be uh, uh, thrown into prison or killed before our faith. Listen, they will not do that unless they have the permission of heaven. Our God's in control. And we, can, and we can trust Him and, uh, with our lives. And then third, disobedience to government receives consequences from God. Listen, we have no right to oppose. We don't want to disobey just laws. Look at verse 2 now. Whosoever therefore resists the power resists the ordinance of God. He says opposition to government is opposition to, opposition to God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Or they receive judgment. So a Christian will be judged by the government if they violate the law. And you kind of a double whammy because it will be judged by God as well. Let's flip back over to, now we probably read this last time too, but 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. And here again, is, he, again he, he tells us of, of this responsibility. He says, submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Uh, whether it be to king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and, and for the praise of them that do well. Uh, for so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. 
as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. So Robert Haldane just, just sums it up. The people of God then ought to consider resistance to the government under which they live as the very awful crime, even as it's resistance to God himself. So God takes that rebellion uh, uh, against authority seriously. Remember Korah and his followers, he rebelled against Moses. They swallowed up in the earth and because of the wickedness of the people's heart and their rebellion, 14,700 others were killed instantly by a deadly plague. Unless Aaron had, uh, uh, had, uh, had inter intervened there uh, through uh, making atonement, the whole congregation would have been annihilated. Because rebelling against civil government is rebellion against God himself, and no Christian wants that. So, but Brian, Brian, do you know who our leaders are today? Brian, do you know what they're doing today? Folks, God knows, and he says we're to obey them. We're to, be, we're to be model citizens who are respectful to governing authorities. We're not to be demeaning. We're not to be demanding. We're not to be rebuking, uh, employing other tactics to have our way uh, and to see our uh, rights resolved. We're to honor the king. We're to realize there's a higher, there's a greater, there's an eternal divine king who holds these earthly kings in his hand. So disobedience to government receives consequences from God. And then fourth, notice here, we're to be obey civil authorities because government serves to restrain evil. This is what it's supposed to be doing. Look at verse 3 now. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. That God's ordained government to restrain evil. You know, that to deter murder and theft and other crimes. And, you know, because of the fall, we, we have a conscience. We, we know good and evil. That's what Romans 1, 18 and 19 says. And so rulers know what is evil, and they're supposed to punish evil behavior and be promoting good behavior. Basic morality is essential, you know, if a society is going to make it or not. No society can last very long if, you know, if there's, there's theft and dishonesty and sexual immorality and violence and murder. That will destroy any society. And so they are to restrain uh, evil. And then fifth, we're to, we're to uh, uh, obey civil authorities because government uh, promote good. Uh, look at the, the latter part of verse 3. Will thou then be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. That God intends government to promote public good. Generally speaking, in, in peaceful, you know, law-abiding citizens, you have favorable treatment by, by their governments throughout history. You know, if a person does good, then they should be, you know, praised by the government for that. And then let's finish there in that verse 4. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God and revenger of of the, uh, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Now, I was thinking about that. You know, even when government refused to acknowledge his God, when it punishes evil, rewards good, it re represents the very character of God. That revenger or avenger there means to exact a penalty. There are penalties for doing wrong. Listen, that's God's purpose for government. Even unbelievers who say that oh, we don't believe in absolute moral truth and inherently, listen, they know that it's wrong. I guarantee you, if you went to an atheist home and you took his car or you vandalized his home, what would he say? You can't do that. It's against the law. Only thing he's not thought about, the only valid basis for moral law is existing morality. No matter where you go in the world, stealing and damaging people's property, it's considered wrong because God has placed that within our hearts. God ordained government to reflect his attributes of justice and equality, of impartiality and righteousness and honesty and so on. Government is to be concerned with moral issues because laws are based on the moral perfection of God. But that's not saying that, that government can develop moral, morality in a citizen. That it, it can prescribe penalty. It can, it can enforce the, them to restrain evil. But it cannot change the people involved. It cannot change the heart. The only thing that can ever change people is the power of God working through the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Folks, that's what we're to be about. We got the greatest message in the world. The truth is the solution for, uh, that, uh, for the, an immoral society is not more law. It's a church winning souls for Christ. That is our mission. So let's just kind of close with two reminders here. Help us to stay focused upon this. Stay focused as a church. Stay focused as Christians. Never forget our mission. We're to go make disciples. Make followers of Jesus Christ. We're to make learners of our Savior. God has not called us to go and make bad people better, to make moral people, uh, go to make a monotheist. Uh, there are many who believe in one God. They may even believe in the true God, but they'll die and go to hell, as James 2, 19 says. The demons even believe and tremble. And realize we're not even called just to go out and make converts. Our mission is to go and make disciples. And then a disciple will go and influence his world, whether he or she is a lawyer, whether they're a politician, whether they're a member of the PTO, they could be a salesman or a mechanic, a doctor or a housewife. The mission is the same for all of us. The only difference is the fear of influence we have in proclaiming Jesus Christ. That is our mission. Cal Thomas was one of the architects of the failed moral majority of the 1980s. His method was picked up by a Christian coalition and focused on the family. Now listen to what he wrote years later about this. He says, for Christians, the vision of worldly power and influence is not a calling but a distraction. It's a temptation that Jesus Christ himself rejected not because it was dangerous, but because it was trivial compared to his mission. Amen. Never forget where you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the remote, remotest parts of the world. Go you and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, teaching them to obey all that I command you. Listen, church, never, never forget the mission. And in second, let us re reaffirm our message. Uh, 1 Peter 2.9. I like this. It says, um, But you are a chosen generation. You're a rural priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the, the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Folks, we are to proclaim eternal life. That is our message. You know, how many politicians have heard from Christians regarding their views, perhaps our disappointments with them and frustrations and threats, and yet without telling them the gospel, without telling them, Jesus Christ loves you. You know, I'm going to tell on Brenda. A few months back, Brenda wrote the, an email to uh, Target that uh, she's no longer going to shop there, and, and she's pretty com committed to that because they was uh, selling the gay pride t-shirts. And listen, I praise God I have a wife that she's got some convictions and she's got a passion for her Lord. But, you know, that kind of made me uncomfortable. I didn't know that because I, I was just uncomfortable because I'm a wimp and I hate confrontation or something like that. But, uh, but I wasn't, couldn't put my finger on that. And I know it, was relaying the, uh, it wasn't relaying the love of Christ, but it, it was stating the truth. And, and it was, but the problem, it was not sharing the gospel. It was not sharing the good news of Jesus Christ that, yes, that is a sin, and God will judge that sin, but he loves you so much. He sent his only begotten son in this world, and if you believe in him, you can have eternal life. That's, the, that, that, that's our mission. That's our message. That's what we got to get out to the world. That's what we're to be about. An author was interviewed by a reporter on, on Christians' opinions on, on various issues. And at the end of the interview, the author asked the reporter, has anyone shared uh, the gospel with you? And the reporter was serious. He said, what is the gospel? Folks, that's what we've got to be about. We must keep our focus uh, on, on, uh, on proclaiming Jesus Christ. We must stay on our task by remembering our mission, by reaffirming our message. Let's proclaim the gospel that brings honor and dignity to the cause of Jesus Christ. That's what makes a difference in society. That's what our purpose is uh, as uh, in the, this country that we live in. Norm, won't you come to the song of invitation?
And as always, won't we stand? And um, if God has spoken in your heart in some way, I know it's a little di- different message as we talk about, you know, our authority with the government and all that type of thing. But again, if God has spoken in you some way and you just want to come forward tonight, uh, I want you to uh, feel free to do that as, uh, as we sing. Uh, Lord, our Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you again so much for this message tonight. And Lord, let us keep the focus on what it needs to be. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful country that you've given us to live in. We do thank you for uh, uh, the freedoms and all that we have. Uh, but Lord, so many times we want to try to, uh, try to fight the world with the world's uh, 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 weapons instead of uh, the, the weapons that you've given us spiritually. And, and, and Lord, uh, do we forget, Lord, if we would just be holy and be the salt and light that you called us to be, that, that Lord, if we uh, uh, witness to our neighbors and, and the people we con- come in contact with and tell them about Jesus Christ and the gospel and make disciples, Lord, that's the only thing that has lasting impact. That's the only thing that will, will last uh, uh, in, in our lifetime and then even throughout eternity. And so, Lord, just, just right now, just, uh, just help us to be the, the, the people, the church you called us to be, and we'll give you the glory for it all. Amen. So, Norm, won't you play a song? Seated above, enthroned in the Father's love, destined to die, poured out for all. 